So I think I brought you up to date. Uh, the haircut, again, daughter-in-law did it yesterday uh, here in the backyard. So it's all legal and uh, it didn't cost me any money. And uh, she didn't butcher it. If you look there, it's, it's pretty good, actually. She and uh, things are still moving uh, target with uh, how we can run our church services once that starts, whether they're singing or no singing. Uh, Windsor Essex is in phase one still. And uh, I have strep throat, but uh, it's fine. I got meds and uh, the world is going to be okay. World is going to be okay. So let me pray for you and uh, let's get going, right? Mark chapter four, but let me pray for you. Father, we just pray for everybody that's uh, tuned in tonight. We just pray that you would just speak to us uh, through your word and that uh, good things would come from your word, that uh, it would uh, achieve what it is that you have set out for it tonight. We just pray for our region. We are still in phase one, and you know that that's affecting a lot of people economically. So we pray that we can get this all cleared up with the agro workers. And uh, we also pray for those that aren't well. There's a few of us not feeling necessarily 100%, but we just pray that you would be with us and others. Lord, we still have some people in our church family that are experiencing as well some economic pain. Um, the longer this goes on, it's, it's eroding their savings and things like that. So we just pray for them on a personal level, just people we know and care about on a personal level. But there's also so many others that you just take care of them as well. And we pray for the needs of the body, whether they've been spoken or not, that there's always something going on in our families, in our homes. And we just pray that you'd care for us as well. And uh, we just thank you for all of that in Jesus name. Amen. So if you've got your Bible study notes, there they are backwards on your screen um, you're on page 13 so go to page 13 and while you're uh, getting your Bible study notes page 13 I'll tell you what's going on in the backyard my rabbit bat is back my pet rabbits running around my backyard and I've got two kids swimming in a swimming pool uh, two doors down that are uh, being a little bit loud so if you hear screaming uh, that's not my mother-in-law or Karen uh, that's just a couple of kids in the swimming pool uh, down a couple of doors. So are y'all good there? Mark chapter four, and I'm going to begin just by reading some of it, and then we'll, we'll get into the study. And again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. And the crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got in a boat and sat in it uh, on the edge of the lake. And while the people were along the shore at the water's edge, uh, he taught them many things by parables, and I'm going to be talking to you about uh, parables. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, listen. So here's the first parable. Listen, a farmer went out to sow seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly. Uh, but because the, uh, because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Verse 7, other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew and produced a crop multiplying 30, 60, or even a hundredfold. And then Jesus said, he who has ears, let him, uh, uh, ears to hear, let him hear. When he was alone, the 12, meaning the 12 disciples that, remember, we mentioned last week, and Deb, I have not forgotten your chocolate treat. Uh, when he was alone, the 12 and the others around him asked him about parables, and he told them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing, perceiving, and ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. So I'm going to stop there at verse 12. And yes, Crystal, I actually have a bunny trail. They come through the fence and into the yard, and I got bunnies. So um, we, we're beginning in Mark chapter 4. We're dealing with the parable of the sower. And the big thing here is, is that I'm introducing to you um, the thought about parables. We're going to get into a whole bunch of different parables of what they mean. Um, I think one of the things that you need to recognize in a parable is parables generally have uh, one big meaning, one full meaning. There's not a lot of little meanings in them. 
Uh, there's like one thing you have to understand. There may be parts to the one thing that you have to understand, but there is one thing that you have to understand. There's one truth that you're looking for. And so that's important with every, every parable. Uh, when uh, someone like me is preaching from a parable, it's always, you know, my way of knowing if I've done my homework is whether or not I've clearly expressed to you the truth that you should be finding. And if you're not, then I really haven't done my homework in that. So parables have one truth, one meaning, one story that they're trying to represent. And you'll see that here in our first parable in Mark chapter 4. But the, the big question that you might have is this. Why does Jesus use parables? And so you'll see that on page 13 as we're getting into this underneath the parable of the sower. Uh, you'll get into this about what's the point of parables. Because when you first started reading your Bible in the New Testament, you know, you're a new convert, you're just following Jesus, you can't wait to get into the scriptures. If you've been going to church for a while, uh, you know, the pastor or somebody in the church has probably said to you, you know, you need to start with the Gospels, read the Gospels first, you know, maybe the Gospel of John, but they tell you to read the Gospels. And, well, you're not into the Gospels very long and you see parables. And as a, you know, as a new convert or a new Christ follower, someone that maybe doesn't know much about the Bible, you start reading these parables and you ask yourself, what? Like, what are they trying to tell me? In this case, let's use Mark 4 here. Why are we talking about seed and soil? Like, Jesus, if you got something to say, just come out and say it. Like, don't, don't use this archaic uh, teaching uh, method of, parables but this is one of the things that you have to understand is is back in the Middle Eastern and Eastern cultures and, and I mean I'm no expert on this but there's you know different schools of thought different ways to teach truth uh, you know whether you know you're from Japan or China or let's say you know Canada but in the Middle East uh, you know parables uh, storytelling through parables was was a thing um, but it wasn't always clear what the thing was that the teacher was trying to teach. And so you will see the passage there that's quoted in verse 12. They may be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. And that's a quote from Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. And you'll see that you know, in your, uh, in your Bible there as, as a reference, as a cross-reference. So you folks are fortunate here because when I was in Bible college, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth, and it does feel like it was that long ago, when I was in Bible college uh, back in the good old days, I actually uh, did an essay on parables, like what's, what's with parables. So I did some de detailed research into that. I know you're really impressed by that right now. I can tell by the yawning. Um, and I'm not going to uh, read you the essay because believe it or not, I do have all my stuff from Bible college. I got it in a big, big box, but I'll spare you that. But uh, the gist is this about a parable. Parables were used by teachers, uh, you know, back in those days and at other times as a means of sharing the truth and veiling the truth at the same time. Now you might say, Brent, that's dumb. How can you share the truth and veil the truth at the same time? So that's a good question, that's fair. So this is how it goes. The idea of Jesus using a parable was that truth was shared, but basically, only those who really wanted to know figured it out. Only those who really, really had a thirst, a desire, a passion, an interest, a curiosity, took the time to think about it, to kind of sort it out what was being said by the teacher, regardless of whether that was Jesus or somebody. And, um, I will prove to you, I will prove this to you in more detail 
when we get to the lamp and the stand, which begins in Mark 4, verse 21, because that picks up on this theme. But you'll notice what it says here in verse 12 from Isaiah. They will be ever seeing, but never perceiving, ever hearing, but never understanding, right? They'll see it, they'll hear it, but they won't perceive, uh, perceive it and they won't understand it. In other words, it's, they're hearing it, they're seeing it, it's in front of them, but they just can't quite figure it out. And the reason why they just can't quite figure it out is because they really don't want to. This is the idea of not being spoon fed. Now, uh, we had uh, Father's Day here yesterday and I had one of my grandchildren with us. And uh, for the most part now, he feeds himself. Uh, you know, Taylor breaks up the food and it's on, in a plate and he just grabs and goes, right? Smashes and dashes. But uh, we had some homemade butterscotch pudding yesterday and a little bit of whipped cream on top of it. And so uh, Darren, his dad, was feeding him, uh, you know, spoon feeding him. And you never seen a kid go through this stuff like he did. Like, man, he just loved this. But the whole idea of being spoon fed is I don't have to do any work. You, you, you know, you give it to me. All I got to basically do is, right, open up my mouth and swallow. Well, when it comes to spiritual truth, that's what some people want too. You tell me what I need to know. You tell me what I need to understand. You tell me how to figure it out. You know what? Don't even tell me how to figure it out. Uh, you, you raise the question, you give me the answer, and I'll nod my head. Oh, okay, that's what it is. So parables were a way of sharing the truth and veiling the truth at the same time. And the whole idea was the teacher understood that only those who were really curious about finding out the truth would. Ever perceiving, you know, uh, pardon me, ever seeing but never perceiving, ever, uh, you know, ever hearing but never understanding. And that would have been the condition of most people in the days of Jesus, that they weren't really interested in spiritual truth. There were spiritual teachers all around them, but they weren't really that interested in knowing the truth. And so I've jumped ahead to that because that's going to help you with all parables. Generally speaking, when Jesus teaches by a parable, he is veiling the truth to sort out who really is interested in knowing, who really wants to find out, who's curious enough to go the whole distance. You know, we would say it in this sense, you know, where is the spirit stirring? And in those whom the spirit is stirring, there will be a desire to sort all of this out. <clears throat> but for, for, for the most for most cases in Jesus' time, people weren't interested in doing the work. Uh, they weren't interested in kind of figuring out for themselves. And what we'll see is even the 12, the disciples, weren't really sorting this out. But as you're moving through the parables, whatever, you know, book of the Bible that you're in that's got a parable, whatever gospel or, you know, some of the Old Testament writings, look for that one truth. You know, sometimes it takes a bit of work to dig it out to like, well, what exactly is Jesus getting at? I hear what he's saying. I think I know where he's going, but what exactly is he getting at? You'll always have to remember that. Just look for the one good thing there. You might find other sprinkles of other good things, but look for the main thing when you're studying a parable. So let's look for the main thing in Mark chapter four, when he's talking about a farmer going out to sow seed. So here he is. It's a parable. You know, let, let me just refer to it as a metaphor. He, he's, he's talking about a farmer sowing seed, but he's not talking about a farmer sowing seed. But what he does use is he uses a, a, life, a life example. You know, in those days, uh, lots of farmers, uh, you know, um, and people would have been aware of what's going on, you know, um, in... Uh, in these days, you know, this may not be a great parable in 2020, uh, you know, in uh, on the Gardner Expressway for people that have never seen a farm. But in Jesus time, you know, this works. So he says, a farmer went out to sow seed and as he was scattering the seed, some of it fell along different paths and some of it didn't produce and some of it produced really well. <clears throat> so you ask yourself, well, what's Jesus getting at here? It's a parable. It's a farmer sowing seed. And the seed was scattered on different kinds of path, different kinds of soil. And some of it did well, some of it didn't. So you would say to yourself, so? 
You know, what's this got to do with my life? Well, let's keep reading. Let's go to verse 13 and let's look at the so part of this. And <clears throat> because my throat's bothering me, cheers. <clears throat> let's look at verse 13, Mark 4. Then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? So, you know, he's a, uh, He's a little frustrated with his with his own 12, right? They don't get it either. You know, this. remember, this is the guy that uh, Jesus said, uh, you know, to some of them, are you so dull? So not always the sharpest knife in the drawer, these guys. So they don't know what's going on either. So he's going to explain to them what's going on beginning at verse uh, 14. So the farmer sowing seed. So verse 14, the farmer sows the word. The sar farmer sows the word. So now we understand from earlier on in Mark 4, four that <clears throat> the seed that the farmer is sowing is the word of God. So um, he, he shares that. Now, you know, the farmer isn't necessarily God. Who do you think the farmer is? Just think about that. If you got a thought for the farmer, who might the farmer be? If the farmer is sowing the word of God, who might the farmer be? You got a thought for that? Another drink. Give you a sec. So if you got a thought, type that in. The farmer really is anybody, anybody that sows the word of God. Now, we sometimes think about this, well, you know, it's Jesus sowing the word of God. Sure, Jesus is a farmer. Now, you might say, well, you know, you got a pastor on, on some day, uh, you know, sharing the word of God. Sure. And as Ed just said, us, anybody, anybody that is sh sowing um the word of God is 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 the farmer. I uh, all of you there have chimed in. Us, Pastor Adam, some bizarre comment about me having some liquid, some content in my cup that might be something other than the tea and cream that I'm drinking. Would you please pray for him? So the farmer sows the word, and the word is. Uh, pardon me. The farmer sows the seed, and the seed is the word of God. And any of us that are sharing the word, you're, you're, you're scattering seed. Now, this is really important to you and I because over the years, um, you know, we marvel sometimes at how effective our sowing has been. And we also marvel sometimes at how ineffective our sowing has been. And we wonder sometimes, hey, God, is, you know, is there something, there's something wrong with me? Because we know it's not the Word of God. The Word of God is, is, is solid. The Word of God is absolutely solid. So we wonder, well, maybe it's the delivery, right? Maybe it's the way I shared it. Maybe it's something I said or didn't say. And hey, look, you know what? When you and I are sharing our faith, there's all kinds of factors. When we're sharing the Word of God with people, there's all kinds of factors. Um, you know, not least of which is the Spirit of God, right? Not least of which is, again, uh, you know, the person who is is hearing the Word, right? But maybe not perceiving. Um, you know, it's not just about your delivery and how well you know this Scripture verse or how well you know that Scripture verse. That's, that's, that's not always the thing, right? So don't be too hard on yourself. I'm always concerned that, you know, that we're too hard on ourselves. If you have an opportunity to life God is going to be there working with you but it's not just about you so here we go this is another one of the key factors let's look at verse 15 some people some people are like the seed along the path where the wood is sown uh, as soon as they hear it Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them so the idea is this and again Jesus uses some wonderful word pictures here the farmer sowing the seed, but some of the seed falls on a path that's been walked on, uh, you know, and that it's hard, right? So the seed doesn't penetrate into the soil. 
and it doesn't have an, an opportunity to, to produce roots. And, and why is that? Well, because when people, maybe the farmer, right? The, you know, the people that are walking along the path make it so hard, that the seed can't break through uh, into the soil, right? It can't die into the soil and then, you know, produce a root and then. So this is what, what Jesus is saying. Some people are like that. They're, they're hard and the word is sown, the seed is sown, but hard Satan is, it quickly can come and just take that seed that was sown away from them. So let's look at it, verse 15, the latter half. Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them, right? So it's there, it lands, but almost immediately Satan takes it away. The other, verse 16, other like seeds sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy, but because they have no root, they last only a short time. So one goes from, you know, practically zero time to the other to just a little bit of time because the soil is rocky. And again, it, it just, there's no root. There's no opportunity for a root there because of the rocky soil. So they receive it at first. It's like, good, 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 good. But it doesn't get down deep enough. It, it can't establish the roots. And you know people like that too, right? You shared, you shared Jesus with them. They may have sounded excited, interested. They may have even come out to church a few times and thought, wow, this is great and wonderful, but you know, didn't last. It, it never got rooted in them. Uh, so verse 17, but since they had no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly, right? They last only a short time and they quickly fall away. And you could probably put names to people that you know that you shared the word. It's, they, it was received with joy, but it lasted only a short time. Something happened. Something happened and uh, they lost faith, lost trust, lost confidence in God. Um, <clears throat> uh, an interesting story, um, at least I think it was interesting. It's, uh, it's too bad I have to go so far back for this one. But um, when we first went to Wawa, when we uh, volunteered to go to Wawa, uh, the reason why we went there wasn't that the church was enormous. We went there because it was a small church that was really experiencing a move of God. People were getting saved. A spirit was moving. And uh, the pastor there was just looking for some help to disciple the, the flock, the growing flock, and especially, you know, with the younger ones. So Karen and I went and uh, we got to know this fellow named Bob. Again, because we're Facebook Live, I won't say his whole name, but we got to know this guy named Bob, a young guy. Uh, you know, lived a life of sin, uh, you know, wasn't a criminal or anything, but just, you know, loose, loose, fast and free, motorcycle guy. And uh, he had given his heart to the Lord and uh, was in the, you know, a, a few weeks of being saved. And uh, one day while we were out doing something, he lost his motorcycle helmet, you know, which was even in those days, a significant amount of money for this single guy. And I remember thinking to myself, oh God, this, this is going to kill his faith because we prayed, God, help us find, help us find the motorcycle helmet. If he doesn't find the motorcycle helmet, you know, Bob's going to lose his faith. You know, I, I, I thought about this, right? When trouble or persecution comes, they quickly fall away. I was really afraid that Bob was going to say, well, if God doesn't answer this prayer, what's the point of serving him? And thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus that we found the motorcycle helmet. I don't remember all of the circumstances surrounding that, but I just remember he found his motorcycle helmet and it was such a relief to us and such a faith booster to him, you know? So we understand that when people are new in the Lord, when troubles or persecution comes, it can scare off. It can. If, if the word falls in rocky places and they don't have time you know, to establish some roots and don't have some time to get the word of God in them, you know, um, that they, they can fall away quickly when uh, trouble or persecution comes. Uh, so verse 18, let's go on to the next group. Still others like seeds sown among the thorns, hear the word, but the worries of life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desire for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. So this is another group and unfortunately the seed falls into thorns and 
if you remember the thorn bushes that, you know, the, that were put into the, the crown that was pressed into Jesus' head, we're not talking about like little wee thorns. We're talking about like major thorns here. There's some trees that grow around Essex uh, that got some thorns that are like that long, right? They're that long. I mean, they're not thick, but they're that long. I mean, these are weapons. Um, and so, you know, the word is sown into thorns. It's, it's, it's sown into people's lives that maybe there's already, you know, um, what would you say? There's, there's already a lot of anxiety. There's already a lot of worries. There's already a lot of worldliness with these people. Their eyes are already set on other things and not the things of God. And so it's like the, the word that's sown into these thorns where other things just take over. Uh, they've got an interest in the word of God. The seed sown hasn't really taken plant though. And they get distracted by other things, right? Verse 19, but the worries of life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. So there's no fruit. There's no fruit. And I don't know if Jesus thinks of these, you know, as he's working through from the seed that falls along the path to this, the thorns. I don't know if he's thinking a time frame where they last from, you know, seconds to minutes to hours to days to weeks to months. I don't know. Um, but we've seen people that seem to walk with God for a long time. And next thing you know, we hear a story of they're not walking with Jesus anymore. And so... You know, the story I told you about Bob and Wawa, that, that's a long time ago. But recently, and in fact, as, as, uh, as recent as last week, I was having a discussion with somebody known to us. And they were talking about, you know, a family member of theirs that walked with God a long time. And then all of a sudden, or I don't know if I should say all of a sudden, but seems like all of a sudden, basically just said, look, I'm not walking with Jesus anymore. And, uh, you know, I'm not following Jesus. I don't agree with the teachings of the Bible. I've got issues with this, that, or the other thing when it comes to the Bible or church or Christians. And absolutely devastating to the family, you know, to see someone that seemingly was in love with Jesus and walking the walk. Um, but all of a sudden, again, there's that expression, all of a sudden, uh, you know, isn't walking with God. So I, I just want to speak to, to each of you that's watching tonight. Um, you know, the worries of life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in and choke the word. Don't think that that's only for brand new Christians. Don't think that, you know, like I am a firm believer in Philippians chapter one. He who began a good work in you will see it completion, you know, and, uh, I've always, you know, kidded with the church a little bit that, uh, you know, when it comes to Calvinism, I'm not into all of the rep of the reformed teaching, but I think there's some stuff that they teach about our position in Christ that's really solid, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Uh, you know, the whole idea that God's pre preordained some to be saved and some not to be saved, all that I don't buy. But this whole idea about what it means to be founded in Christ, to be in Christ, and the security that comes to us, like I'm a firm believer in that, that he who began the good work will see it to completion. I also know that, you know, Peter teaches, you know, those of us that keep our walk the way it's supposed to be will never suffer a fall. Um, the word there is reversal, and it's, it's a Greek word. I don't know pronounce it but in the English it's it's translated p-t-a-i-o will never uh, suffer a, a reversal will never suffer a fall and so like I, I'm you know I'm strong in that you take care of yourself God's grace is working with you you're going to be fine but passages like this tell us that if we let things creep in and it's he's specific here the worries of life the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things. So, like, that's broad. That's broad enough to say that, you know, as Christ followers, we ought to be careful, you know, with how we're taking care of ourselves spiritually and, and, and being careful.
careful with the things of this world, you know, the first John 2.15 stuff, you know, the desires of this world, right? So I would just caution, you know, the church family, those of you that are watching or those of you that may be watching that aren't part of the, the church family. If you say that you're a Christ follower, and, you know, and you think like, well, I've punched my card, everything's good. Take care of yourself spiritually. Keep feeding on the word of God. Make sure that it's producing you know, um, a crop 30, 60, 100 fold. Make sure it's, it's being fruitful because worries will come. The deceitfulness of wealth. Now, you may not think that uh, you're wealthy. I certainly don't feel that I'm wealthy. But, uh, you know, I, I just stepped out of a nice house into a nice backyard. And I'm using my wife's uh, iPhone 11 here. So when it compares to like with three quarters of the world, I'm wealthy. I'm very wealthy. For those of us that have been, you know, to Cuba or the Dominican Republic or Honduras or some, you know, nation that's not as uh, blessed as we are, you know, you know, you know that you have lots of stuff. So we have to be careful about that and, and the desires for other things, right? The desires for other things. We can have a lot and want more more of the, the, the stuff of this world that we think is going to satisfy or whatever, right? That means that we're successful or in a good place. So just be careful, folks. It says that those things come in and they choke the word and they make it unfruitful. When you think of a person being choked, and, and that's a sensitive issue these days, if you watch the news, the idea is that they can't breathe, right? I can't breathe. The whole idea is there's no oxygen supply. And the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in and they, they choke off the oxygen, the life force of the word of God in your life. You may, you may know the word, but it doesn't have spiritual impact anymore. You may know some of the word, but you're not trying to live in obedience to it. You may know some of the word, but the spirit doesn't seem to be convicting like he used to because it's being off in us and it makes the word unfruitful. So be careful of that. Just be careful of that. Don't be thinking about this as simply applying to someone who's a brand new Christian who hasn't got the feet on the ground, hasn't got the roots down, doesn't really know what's going on and they're just blowing here or there. Mm, this, I think this progresses where for you and I, we, we need to be careful of that. Now, the last thing is uh, the farmer in sowing the word is verse 20. Others like seeds sown on good soil. So I'm assuming this is you folks. Others, meaning you folks, meaning me, hopefully, like seeds sown on good soil. Hear the, now, notice, notice the, uh, um, how linear this is. They, they hear the word. They and they accept the word, and because of that, it produces a crop. It's fruitful 30, 60, or even a hundred times what was sown. So, hearing the word is good, but uh, I'm gonna again talk to you about the lamp on a stand in, in, in a few moments, and I'll, I'll remind you that hearing isn't enough. Hearing the word of God and accepting it, and this word accept means right. To bring it in, um, that it has that is established in you, that it's it's not you just going oh yeah that's the word of God that's the Bible, but it's it's acting on the word it's actualizing the word of God uh, in your own life it's um, it's making it fruitful you're doing something you're cooperating with the word of God it's not just there but you're cooperating with the word of God you're acting on the word of God. And because you're doing that, it produces a crop. If I can use my own metaphor, it's like uh, it's like the farmer, right, who breaks up the ground and, uh, you know, may fertilize it, pre-fertilize it, and then puts the seed in and then waters it, you know, weeds it, right, so that it produces a crop. And the better you take care of that, the crop can be, you know, 30 times what you planted or 60 times what you planted, or 100 times what you planted. And so, you know, um, the Bible reminds us in James, uh, you know, don't deceive yourselves. Be not just hearers of the word, but what? James tells us, don't just hear the word, but, but be what? And while you're putting that in there, cheers.
I, I know the, the passage from James <clears throat> because of uh, the King James. Be not just uh, hearers of the word, but blank, blank, there also. And the word is doers. Just don't hear it. Do it. Uh, <laughs> let me illustrate this to you. Remember when you were a kid and your parents told you something? And, they, you know, right? And you, like, you heard it. Like, thanks, Ed. Doers. You know, you heard it. Hey, Jimmy, go clean your room. Jimmy, go cut the lawn. Jimmy, you know, pick your socks off the floor. And you're like, yeah, Mom. Yeah, Dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, they come back an hour later and you didn't do it. And they're like, well, did you not hear me? And, of course, yeah, I heard you. I just didn't feel like it. Like, you know, now that you're in my room breathing fire, I feel like it. But, you know, before I, you know, I just, I didn't feel like it, right? So Bible reminds us that it's not enough to hear it. This is, uh, this is a most wonderful deception, folks. And again, you know, I try to be as pastoral as I can. Not judgmental, just pastoral. Like James 3 says, I'm going to have to give an account for my teaching. Pastor Adams, Pastor Jess, all of those of us that are teachers are going to have to give an account to God how we taught. So I feel like when I'm teaching you the word, I, I have to challenge you to make sure that you're paying attention to it. And, and that you're doing something with it. Like, don't think that because you're on Facebook Live Monday, or you go to a Bible study Wednesday or Thursday, or you listen to the sermon on Sunday, or you're on 12 other podcasts through the week, don't fool yourself into, you know, thinking like, well, I hear the word of God a lot, so I obviously must be a good Christian. If that were the case, James wouldn't say, be not just a hearer of the word, but because we, we ourselves into thinking that if we're under the word of God a lot, that it's fruitful, that we're listening to it, that we're obeying it, that we're paying attention to it, that we're walking in obedience to it. And that isn't always the case. Now, again, I'm not trying to be judgmental. I'm just saying, do some introspection, you know, do some do some measuring in your spiritual life um, that is holding you accountable, that you're asking yourself the tough questions every once in a while. You know, am I walking in obedience to the word of God? Do I see that in my life? Do others see that in my life? You know, um, am I bearing the fruit of the spirit? Do I see the spirit active in my life? Or do I see a lot of things that belong to, you know, the sinful nature, the earthly nature, the flesh? You know, do a Galatians 5 check. Just read Galatians 5 about, you know, acts of the flesh versus, you know, fruit of the spirit. And, if you know, if there's a lot of acts of the flesh and not too much fruit of the spirit, and I'm not just talking about a moment in time. I'm talking about, you know, through our, through our weeks, our months, our years. You know, that's a, good, that's a good time to stop and say, you know what, I may be hearing a lot, but I may not be doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And so here they hear the word, they accept it, and it produces a crop 30, 60, and 100 fold. Now, the good news thing, uh, the good news about this is that a crop that, it, you know, that has a multiplying factor of 30 is great. A crop that has a multiplying factor of 60 is great. A crop that has a multiplying factor of 100 is great. If you're a farmer, you want the 100 because you're going to make more money, right? The seed that you planted has been increased 100 fold. You're going to have way more uh, you know, then you need to eat and consume for your family. So you're going to be able to sell more. So 30, 60 and 100, all of those are really good, right? Because the, the whole idea is that the word of God is fruitful. What I'm saying is, if you're con currently producing at five, and I know that's, that's impossible to measure, but let's just say in your heart, let's just say here in your gut, you feel like, you know what, I'm probably only producing fivefold. I could be doing better. Then, then create an action plan, uh, you know, literally create a plan about well, how could I be more fruitful? What are some things that I could do? Well, you know, might start with stopping some things, but what are some things, what are some positive things that I could do to make myself more fruitful in the kingdom of God? If you're a 20, shoot for a 30. If you're a 30, shoot for a 40. If you're a 60, shoot for 70. And if you're a 100, well, then you're perfect. Don't worry about it. But the whole idea is, is not just to say, well, I am fruitful and just stay there. Uh, you know, what, what could you do to, to be more fruitful? 
if your uh, investment fund, if your broker came to you and said, you know, you're increasing at 5% a year, um, I could get you to 10. Are you interested? Are you interested in doubling from 5 to 10? How many of you would say, oh, no, I'm, I'm happy with 5% return? Of course you'd want to, you know, what do I need to do to, to, to increase this, right, to be more fruitful? Well, spiritually speaking, let's think about some of those things too. Not, not settle into where you're at. Uh, again, 30 is great, 60 is great, 100 is great. But what Jesus tells us, right, that we are, um, there are different levels of fruitfulness and there's probably ways to grow in that. Now, here's the thing. You know, if you're maxed out for God, then that's great. God gives everybody a gift, at least one gift, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12. Um, and part of your fruitfulness is your gifts. Part of your fruitfulness is just walking in the spirit, like Galatians chapter 5. You know, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, meekness, you know, self-control. You know, against such things there is no law. So it's not just about doing, but it's also about being. It's about being filled with the Spirit and filled with the love of God. And, uh, you know, not just about activity, but character. And then again, how that character and that activity flows into other people's lives. You know, you might ask yourself, how am I helping others to be fruitful? It's great to know that, you know, you've produced a 30, 60, or 100-fold uh, by some of the things you're doing. But maybe if you wanted to enhance that, then you could ask yourself the question, how could I help others to be more fruitful? And then, of course, that helps you in the sense that you feel like you're doing more for the kingdom of God, but we're multiplying ourselves. You know, the fancy word for this is discipleship, helping others, right, to be the best that they can be for Jesus Christ. So Jesus then in this parable of the sower, just to kind of sum all this up, you know, he's talking about the farmer, whoever that is, sowing the word of God, anybody that's sowing the word of God, and understanding that the seed is always good, but it falls, it falls on different hearts. It falls on different people. And the problem isn't with the word. The problem is the people that receive the word and what they're willing or unwilling to do with it based on, you know, kind of, their their spiritual condition when they receive it, what's filling their lives at the time, what's happening to them when they receive the word, those kinds of things. And the soil isn't always great, but um, the soil is great for those that hear it and accept it and then are willing to do something with it. The word of God isn't there just to save you. The Word of God is there also to equip you to do something while you are being saved. And I think that's really important for us to realize that the Word of God is not a static thing. That, hey, I got saved because I believed and I was saved, right? You know, Romans chapter 10. But rather, the Word of God is there and I'm supposed to do something, you know, um, just like um, Hebrews 4 and 12. Let me just turn there with you. You got a minute while you're sipping your coffee. Hebrews 4 and 12 says this, right, about the Word of God. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, and it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. So the Word of God is living and active. It's Word of God's always up to something in us. Wants to do something. Like, it's never static. It doesn't just lay there just like a seed planted in a, a you know a farmer's soil right it's growing and it's producing a crop so how are we doing here 721 we got uh, a few minutes left so let me just piggyback this because the lamp on the stand is going to help us again to understand about why Jesus taught in parables and why some people understood and some people didn't understand. There's, there's further here. So you should have been able to, you know, work your way through page 13. And now we're on the top of page 14. If you've been following along and just do that while I'm teaching, just follow along in your notes. So page 14, verse 21 of Mark 4. He said to them, do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? 
Instead, don't you put it on a stand for whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear, right? Notice that says that in Mark 4 verse 9. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Here it comes back to us again in verse 23. Consider carefully what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. Whoever has will be given more, and whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And that has there, whatever he has, you know, uh, will be given more. It's not talking about material stuff. So just so you know, this isn't talking about stuff. So in these days, um, people used oil lamps, just so you know, right? Obviously, it's not an incandescent bulb. It's not an LED bulb. It's not even a waxy candle. They burned olive oil and they had, uh, and you'll see pictures of this. It's all over the internet. It's in archaeology. It's in museums. These, uh, these containers, these, you know, they, some of them look like little teapots. They were all over the place. They can be found anywhere in the Middle East in the past, you know, in ancient past and today. But they they burned they burned uh, they burned oil, and they they weren't necessarily big. They were usually smaller in, in average homes. And the whole idea is this, right? You wouldn't take a lamp that you're trying to light up a room, you know, in order to, you know, I don't know in those days if you'd say to read, but in order to do something, you wouldn't take a lamp and then hide it, put a bowl over it, cover it so that you couldn't see anymore. That would be ridiculous. So Jesus says, do you bring a lamp to put a, it under a bowl or a bed? No, don't you put it on a stand for whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. So the lamp here, and you'll see that, the lamp here on page 14, the lamp lights up a room. Where do you put a lamp? You put a lamp in a place where it can have the greatest impact possible. Where don't you put a lamp? You don't put a lamp in a place where it have the worst impact possible, under a bowl or under the bed, right? And he's just talking about, uh, you know, somebody's home back in those days. But the purpose of the lamp is to give light. Now, it, because it's a parable, what, what light is Jesus talking about? Well, what was he just talking about? And what is he going to be talking about in the next number of verses? The seed, the seed, the seed. The seed is what? Right. The seed's the word of God. So the lamp here represents the word of God. The word of God brings light. The word of God brings light. It brings spiritual understanding. It brings illumination. It brings our understanding of what it is that God wants us to do. So when he's talking here about the word of God, it's the whole idea is to bring the word of God, put it out where it can be seen, put it out where it can be felt, right? And so that people can see clearly. And so he says in verse 23, look, you know, um, pardon me, verse 22, whatever's hidden is meant to be disclosed and whatever's concealed is meant to be brought out in the open. Compare that with Mark 4 about the parables. They may be ever seeing, but never perceiving. They may be ever hearing, but never understanding. So the comparison here that Jesus is doing is that the word of God is to bring light, is, is, is to help us to understand what's, what's going on, what God wants, what God is saying. And so what was concealed now is going to be brought out into the open. It may have been concealed in the past, but Jesus is bringing the truth of God's word out now. Remember, he said he was the light and he's teaching the light. And then he challenges us in verse 24, just like he did back in verse 12, about, you know, hearing it and doing something with it. Consider carefully what you hear. For the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. And whoever has will be given more, but whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken. So as you press in, and I'll have to close with this, as you press in to understand the word of God, the light that God is giving you, the more you press in, you will be given more. If you don't do anything with the light, even the light that you have will be taken away. You're getting some light, press in to get more light. Here, even though it's parables, press in to understand, stretch yourself, learn, grow. But if you don't do that, you'll lose what you have. Even what you have will be lost. The spiritual understanding, the illumination from God, 
you will lose that. And so he's speaking to, you know, his disciples. He's speaking, teachers of the law are probably there. He's got people, you know, from in and around the region of, of the Sea of Galilee. He's got the people of God that have had the prophets of God, that have had the word of God, have signs, wonders, and miracles. And he says, look, if you don't press in now while I'm here, to grasp and understand the spiritual truth that I have for you, even what you have will be lost. And don't we see that happening? The Jews reject Jesus, they crucify him, and the next thing you know, the gospel goes to the Gentiles, and the Jewish people lose their light. Now, Romans tells us they've been cut off just for a time, so the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. But nonetheless, they've lost their light. The people of Israel, for the most part now, are living in darkness. They have lost their light because they didn't respond. And what they had, at least for a season, a long season, has been taken away. So I'm going to stop there. Let me just encourage you, uh, you know, those of you that are still online with us on Mondays, if you have a question or a further comment, you can email to me. I can't guarantee you necessarily I'll get to it tonight, but tomorrow's another work day. But if you've got a question about what I've been teaching, you know, you've got a comment, maybe you don't understand something, maybe you even disagree with something or thinking, hey, Brent, have you ever thought about it this way? I'm open to hear all of that, receive all of that. This way feels a little bit just one-sided, but, but use the email, if, you know, if you're not comfortable with using the chat here, use the email afterwards or sometime this week, and I'll be happy to respond to anything that you have to say. We'll see uh, the rest of the gang Wednesday night and Thursday, providing the weather is good for us. But let me just pray a blessing on you, Father. I just pray that your peace and your love and your spirit will be with your people. Encourage them and strengthen them. Be with them from the time the sun comes up till the time it sets and every moment in between. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, folks. We love you. Take good care of yourselves and take good care of one another. Bye-bye for now.